Would you look with me in Acts chapter 17, this moment where Paul, isn't it wonderful? Paul goes to Jerusalem, Paul goes to Rome, Paul goes to Ephesus, Paul goes right to the seats of power. Here he goes to the seat of intellectual power, and it's there at Athens. Look with me what happens in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue. Notice his provocation did not send him into irrationality or man-made anger, which does not achieve the righteousness of God. It sent him to give account of the hope that's within him reasonably as he reasoned with them. Now, where did he go? Well, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace or the agora every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wished to say. Another said, well, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also, a, a, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps they feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. You remember what you just sung? We borrow life. Our life is borrowed from Him, and our existence is because of Him. We live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of men. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent, because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. In all of this, He has given assurance to all all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom were also Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's Word abides forever. May his, by His grace and mercy, His Word be preached for you. Please be seated. Well, we've got Paul at Athens. Where are we? Well, we're right in the Apostles' Creed, working our way through the seven affirmations of faith, and then five, um, five uh, consequences of these affirmations as we work our way through this. Uh, Creed. You'll note where the apostrophe is. It's after the S, not before the S. The apostles did not create this creed. It was disciples of disciples of the apostles, but what they were doing was giving us apostolic doctrine of the essential truths of Christianity in light of the finished and glorious work of Christ. And it was used as a confession. It was used for discipleship, a confession. It was used to unite believers together as they served the Lord. That was those, the function of the creed. And as, it, and as it gives these essential, the very first affirmation of faith is this one. I believe 
in God the Father Almighty. There's where we parked last week. Now, this week, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker, the very first affirmation of faith, is not directly Jesus going to the cross. The first affirmation of faith to humanity, lost humanity, is that God has made everything and everyone that you see. He is the maker of heaven and earth. Interestingly, you pick it up with the Apostle Paul rapidly, don't you? You find him quickly doing exactly, or let me put it this way. You find the Apostles' Creed following the pattern of the Apostle Paul. Isn't it interesting as you study um, the, the Word of God and you see the progress of the gospel and Paul goes to this intellectual uh, area of Athens and he's provoked by the idolatry. So he begins to, begins to evangelize and disciple. He goes to the Jew. Where can I find the Jew? Synagogue. That's where I'll go there. And I'm a rabbi, so I've got a free ticket to teach unless they run me out. And then he goes into, as a Roman citizen, he can freely move among the agora, the marketplace. <laughs> I'll find the Jews in church, and I'll find the uh, Gentiles out at, um, at the shopping mall. And so he goes, and he, find, he finds he's got two fishing pools, and he starts fishing for men. And as he is there in the agora, he begins to reason with those that are there. And the only two philosophies, there were multiple philosophies in the first century, my goodness, multiple philosophies. Only two are mentioned in your Bible, Epicurean and the Stoics. Now, I am not going to do a deep dive there. I do not have time. But in terms of these two that are mentioned, and some of their philosophers are actually quoted by the Apostle Paul. And you say, well, how can he quote a false philosophy? Well, listen, you know, a blind pig will find a neck horn every once in a while. And, uh, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. So, sometimes philosophers will get something right that you can use because they've borrowed it from truth anyway, and by their observation. And so, he uses a couple of their quotes, and then he begins to deal with them at a place called Mars Hill. And that was the Hill of Mars, or if uh, you were if you were Greek, it was Ares, and that's why it was called Areopagus, the Mountain of Ares. The uh, and so that's the place where all the philosophers would come, saying something. You know, why are they doing all of that? Uh, what does the Apostle Paul tell us? Is that everybody you meet's religious? I see that you're religious. Everybody worships something, somehow, someone. Number three, uh, uh, number three, it's not working. Why would you keep some, searching for something? the new. I mean, I, hopefully when you come here, you tell to John, can we sing the old, old story? Preacher, would you preach the old, old story? I don't need something new. I just need a fresh embrace of the old, old story is what I need. Well, their stuff doesn't work, so they keep, they keep looking for something new. And by the way, with all of these idols, it still doesn't work. They got an idol to this and an idol to that and a God to this and a God to that. It doesn't work. So, I'll tell you what, Let's get one to fill in the gaps. We've got one for the agnostic, the unknown God, what we don't yet know. He said, now that's the one. All of these, they're idols. But now the one that you put that statue up to, let me tell you who he is. He doesn't need a statue. He made you. He doesn't need you to make him something. He doesn't, you serve him. And, and by the way, we do serve him. We serve him with our hands, our hearts, and our minds. But we don't serve him as if he needed us. We serve Him because we needed Him, and He came to us. And then when we are serving Him, and we're walking with Him, and we love Him, what does He tell these Athenian philosophers? This is the God who made everything. Isn't it interesting? If you'll follow Paul, when he goes to a synagogue, where does he start? Jesus. When he goes to the Gentile, where does he start? God the Creator. Folks, everybody, every philosophy, every man-made religion is designed to answer four questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? But what people don't realize many times is you can't answer those four questions. Who am I? 
Where did I come from? Why am I here? Who am I? Identity. Where did I come from? Origin. Why am I here? Significance. And where am I going? Meaning. You can't answer those four questions that you build world and life views without answering this question. Why and how did everything get here? Why is there something and not nothing? Why and how did everything? The question of origins has to go deeper. Why and how does everything that exists Why is it here? Now, if you embrace paganism or if you embrace atheism, if you, whatever you embrace, and by the way, that's a religion, atheism's a religion, and it has worship, it certainly does. If you embrace pantheism, if you embrace positivism, if you embrace scientism, if you embrace materialism, no matter our secularism, secular humanism, if whatever you embrace, you got to answer that question. Why is there something and not nothing? And how is there something and not nothing? Now, all of the man-made religions and philosophies of this age, all of them, and I promise I'm not going any deeper than this, but you got to get this, because you're going to talk to people about this. And this is a wonderful place to start, just like the Apostle Paul when he talks with the Epicureans, when he talks with the Stoics. This is a great place to start with people. So why do you think we're here? How do you think we got here? Now, they've only got two possibilities, so I'm helping, all right? They've only got two possibilities. Now, they may dress it up with different vocabulary, but they only got two possibilities. Possibility number one is we are here and everything is here because it's always been here. Space, time, and matter is self-existent. That's option number one. Space, time, and matter is self-existence, is self-existent, and in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics, which, by the way, we don't contradict anywhere else. I mean, you know, it, go away for a month and come back to your house and tell me if everything's working well. Second law, everything runs down. But in contradiction, the self-existent position, in contradiction says, but uh, space, time, and matter, in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics, is actually evolving up. That's what it is. Secondly, of course, the second option is this. Everything, everything that's here is here because it is self-creating. It has created itself. Now, those are the only two options. Option number one is something is self-existent, and it has evolved upward in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics, that everything's actually running down. The second option is everything is self-creating. That is, nothing said to itself be something. And boy, you're talking about a couple of leaps of faith. I just, I, I can't make it. But that's your only two options. That's it. Those are your only two options. And of course, the second option, self-creating, denies the scientific fact that there is no such thing as spontaneous generation. If you will walk out of here, I'm sure you'll find a dead stick out there. Take the dead stick home, stick it in the ground, and tell me when it blossoms. Things that don't have life can't live. We have life. It's borrowed. It's been given to us. That's why he then said to them, in him who created the heavens and the earth, in him you live, you move, and you have your being. Your life, your motion, your existence is by him, in him, and at the pleasure of him. That's what he then informs them. And the Apostles' Creed just jumps right on board. It not only biblically is biblical in content that God, the first person of the Trinity, Father, is almighty. Any power you have, we got some power. 
You get political power, you get economic power, you get physical power. All power that you have has been granted to you. It's all in Him. Any you got, He gave to you. Yes, like all of your life He gave to you. So that God in whom we live and move and have our being is the one who made us, God the Father Almighty, and He is the maker of heaven and earth and all that it contains. Now, why? Well, it's for His glory. That's why. So how and why are, is there something and not nothing? Because the self-existent God, the eternal God, brought into being the heavens and the earth. And the Apostles' Creed not only gives biblical content, it gives biblical pattern. Where does your Bible start? Your Bible does not start at Calvary. Your Bible starts in Genesis 1-1. Would you turn there with me? It starts right there in Genesis. I know it's familiar, but I'm just asking, turn there anyway. Genesis 1-1. This is one of those moments when the shuffling of pages should be less lengthy than other moments. This one isn't hard. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. All, now get this, please. All philosophies, all man made religion comes from human imagination. And human imagination is created. And human, now keep, hang with me just a little bit further. Human imagination begins its assessment of origins by looking at the creation. And it's given two options. The creation is self-existent or the creation is self-creating. That stands in nonsense to, to the laws of thermodynamics and the fact that there is no spontaneous generation. Christianity only has one option on origins. In the beginning, the eternal God. The reason you got creation laws is there's a creator who is a lawgiver. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that it contains. So, the philosophies of men begin with creation or space, time, and matter. They wouldn't call it creation. So, let me, they would begin with space, time, and matter and then work back to origin. Christianity, which goes not from human imagination but divine revelation, goes to Genesis 1-1, and we start with the eternal God who made the space, time, and matter. Look a little closer to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, time, that's a created reality. In the beginning, time, God created, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. We don't start with space, time, and matter and declare a self-existent space, time, and matter. We don't start with space, time, and matter, a self-creating space, time, and matter. We begin with God who brought into existence space, the heavens, time, beginning, and the earth, the matter of all the universe. That's why, that's where we start. 
That's our faith commitment. I would suggest to you the other two options, starting with the space, time, and matter, and declaring it self-existent or self-creating or some combination thereof. And that's exactly what it is. What is the handbook for atheistic Darwinian evolution? It's Carl Sagan's cosmos. And what is the Apostles' Creed of that? What is the creed of that, of that view of origins? Here it is. The cosmos. That's all there was. That's all there is. That's all there ever will be. That's a faith commitment of the self-eternality, self-existent, self-creating um, creation, uh, space, time, and matter. We look at that and say, and it just doesn't, A, it's not scientific. B, it is nonsense. C, it is irrational. And D, there is a way not to leap in the dark. With that, with that faith commitment, there's a way to walk in the light in the beginning. God, there's something not because nothing became something, there's something because someone spoke and ordered its presence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that it contains. So over here is the Trinitarian faith commitment, space, time and matter. That's all there is. That's all there was. That's all there ever will be. And if, now watch, if we give enough space and enough time, then the matter will produce this. Well, I always ask a question, why is there a universe? Why isn't there a multiverse? I mean, why is there a universe? Everything works in harmony, all these parts. All of these mutations that erupted somehow came together in beautiful harmony? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I'll bow to John Haynes on this one. I just don't think if I, if I put a rat, to quote someone else, I don't know who, if I take a rat and put it on a piano keyboard and shut the thing, I don't think it running up and down is going to produce uh, Mendelssohn. I don't think the Ninth Symphony is going to result from it. I don't think if I take, I don't think if I take, um, pick up sticks and throw them out, they're all going to be lined up in color, size, and everything right in order when I throw them out. I don't think I can take my grandfather's watch, which I love, I'm sorry, my great, great grandfather's watch, which I love dearly. I don't think I can take that, take it apart, put it in my pocket, and shake it, and you know, in about 40 minutes, something's going to tick. That is nonsense. Order does not come from disorder. And it doesn't come by eruptions of mutations. That's what, but that's what the position is of self-existence and self-creating dynamic. What we believe is there is a trinity. God the Father authored the creation. God the Son was in whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. And God the Spirit ordered the creation. Do you see it there? In the beginning, well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth at the very beginning when he created it was what? It was without form and void. Can I give you, I love these Hebrew words, tohu bohu. It was tohu bohu. Give me, let me give you another translation. The earth was unformed and unfilled. That's what it was. Then God spoke that which he had created into order. Six days. The first three days, form it. The next three days, fill what has been formed. He forms it and he fills it with the superintending work of the Holy Spirit. The Father has altered it. The Son has accomplished it. And the Holy Spirit has applied it and sovereignly works over it. You see, there are four great acts of God, and in Acts 17, you'll find all four of them. God is creation, God in creation, God in redemption to save us, and God in 
providence to sustain us, and then God in consummation to bring all things to a conclusion for His glory. Here in creation, the Trinity is at work. In creation, the Trinity accomplishes our redemption. I'm sorry, in redemption, the, the Trinity accomplishes our redemption. In providence, the Trinity sustains us. And in consummation, the Trinity brings all things, the one God in three persons. But here we see the one God in three persons that has brought everything into existence, space, time, and matter. The other position, oh, that's all, space, time, and matter has always been here. It, it either nothing created something or the something just exists and keeps creating and improving itself. That's in opposition to all scientific laws that we have. But the idea is this, if I can get people to buy in to enough space and enough time, then I can convince them this may be, this happened, this universe happened. I always want to ask Carl Sagan, if I could, why did you title your book Cosmos? When did nothing ever create something, and when did something left alone order itself? And instead of a multiverse, you have a universe and a cosmos instead of chaos. But here in Genesis 1, God orders it. We call it ex nihilo. There is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and nothing. And out of no need but for His glory, He spoke into existence everything. As it arrives, it is unformed and unfilled. Then He speaks it and forms it and fills it with the superintending power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Apostles' Creed rightly brings us to the beginning point where the Bible brings us, not only with biblical truth, but in the biblical patterns. This is an ex nihilo creation. God is self-existing. God is the Creator. Not space, time, and matter is self-existing. Not space, time, and matter is self-creating. It is God who creates, God who orders. In Him we live, we move, and we have our being. So let me give you four things that just to walk away with this and then a takeaway, but I'll just give you the four. Here, I mean, I'm sorry, three things. Here's the first one. Because God is the Father Almighty and is maker of heaven and earth, number one, God is distinct from His creation. That says no to pantheism. God is in His creation, but creation is not God. God is present, eminence, but God is also transcendent. He is over. My dear friends, all the way from Gnosticism to today's, to, but today's um, secular humanism is the notion, is the idea, is the embrace that the creation is not a creation. It is self-existing, and it is God. So man worships and serves the creature and the creation instead of the Creator. And to do so, man has to, it's not a lack of information. General revelation in creation and special revelation in the Word give abundant give abundant evidence that that is not true. But man, what is man's problem? It's a heart problem. Man suppresses the truth that is clearly seen in unrighteousness. It is our sin nature that causes us to say to God, we're going to kidnap the creation for our glory instead of as the creation give you glory. We're going to exist in cosmic treason against the Creator. And we'll find any and every way to sophisticate ourselves into imbecility. It is the fool that has said there is no God. We will do everything we can. And what is our motivation? We, it's a sin nature. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But the truth of the matter is there's a creation because there was first a creator. And he is in his creation, but he is distinct from it. God, the creator, and his creation.
Secondly, not only is God distinct, God has built distinctions in His creation, just as God exists. One God in three persons, distinct, and you see the distinction, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. One being, God, three persons. And that when you see that, that's reflected in His creation. God makes man male and female. Now, let me ask you a question. If you want to rob God of His glory, and if you think that all of life is about you and from you, and that you exist, and the only kind of God you'll have is one that is there to make you happy and to affirm you, if that is what you believe, what is the way you get at that God? Well, you not only suppress the truth that He is the Creator and His creation, all of it ought to give Him glory. The other thing you do is this God that is distinct from His creation, you attack all of the distinctions. So, no longer is male and female, male and female. It's just, well, what do you want to be? Now, I understand gender dysphoria and the adolescent issues there, but that's not what we're talking about in the current sexual revolution. What we're telling to God is, I'm not going to be who you made me to be. We will overrule your distinctions to attack the one who is above and distinct from His creation. We'll redefine marriage. We'll redefine sexuality. We will read what you have declared as wrong, we will declare as right. That's what we will do. But the creation stands, and every time you break God's law, it will break you. You break God's laws of creation, it will break you. And so, what we find is a, we find that here is God distinct from His creation, and because He created it, you now have a universe, and here is God building distinctions in His creation, but man in his sinfulness and treason and sinful nature denies God's distinctives. No longer is it man and the animals, it's just man one of the animals. No longer is it man, male, and female, just what do you want to be? Forget the biological truth. Just what fabrication do you want to embrace? No longer is marriage one man, one woman, one life. Marriage is for, well, as long as your needs are met and anybody that wants to agree to it in contradiction to God's Word. But not only is there to create, not only is it distinct, and not only is there distinctives, but thirdly, a, a distinction, but thirdly, man is distinct. You see, now, now you're ready. When you understand that God made you, God is distinct, and He made you indistinctive. He put man over creation, male and female. Let us make man in our image. Now you see not only distinct God as creator, uh, distinctions in the creation, but you see the distinctiveness of man made in his image. Now you can answer those four questions. Who am I? Imago Dea. Man made in the image of God, male and female. Now you can answer the question. Why am I here? God, in His good pleasure, made you for His glory and your joy when you give Him glory. That's why I am here. I have purpose. I am here. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Well, you're headed to judgment in rebellion against God. But you're, handed, you're headed to glory if by God's grace you have embraced the Creator as your Redeemer. Here's the way I put it. To confess God the Father Almighty. To confess God the Father Almighty as maker of heaven and earth. That's why it's so important, this first affirmation. Is to confess man as created in the image of God, male and female, 
and to deny that man is a mutated cosmic accident. That in fact, we have value because God has assigned it to us in our creation. And that means, the last thing I'll just say before I'll just give you briefly the takeaway is this. Cosma, chaos, cosmos, chaos, cosmos. Harry, what are you talking about? God created chaos. It was unformed and unfilled. And then God, in, in six days, established it with his laws and formed it and filled it. So there's no longer chaos there is now cosmos, an ordered creation. By his decree, he ordered it into existence through his son, Jesus Christ, superintended by the Holy Spirit. Then man decides in Adam and with Eve, man decides, we will not give you glory as you have made us and ordered us. It's not about you, it's about us. We will be. I mean, getting amazing. He said, you can be like God. All Adam had to say was, I already am. I already am made in his image. The real thing is, do you want to be God? And now in cosmic treason and sin, man brings Brand brings chaos. The creation is groaning. The body is groaning. All of everything is groaning. We're seeing it all over, even now in our nation, with fractures here and fractures there and divisions here, divisions there, incivility here, um, a lack of a lack of a sense of the of the dynamic and special nature of what it means to be made in the image of God. And if you love God, how do you treat those made in the image of God? This what this thing called the human race with its multiple ethnicities. And so man has created chaos because of his sin. But praise God, this God who could speak the Almighty and order the creation is the same God who can speak and save sinners to his glory with a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. So now in Christ, don't you love it when Jesus, don't you love it when Jesus walks up to this Lazarus, the tomb, and there's so much there, I don't have time. I, in fact, I'm just about out, so I can't go there, but ah, oh my goodness, what, what a glorious moment as he sees what sin has brought in its chaos and death. And he rears up, and then he speaks. He orders Lazarus, come forth. That is the one who ordered, and the heavens and the earth and all that is in it is flung out in the perfect order of the laws he has established. Then he brings the law to sinful man, and then the gospel to bring the chaos of our sin to a new order. And that order is in Jesus Christ. God created everything by his word, and now God redeems his people through his word. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us. And he is not only redeeming his people, he has promised us a new heavens and a new earth that is cosmos and cannot be corrupted by our sin. There will be no weeping, no death, no sickness. None of that will be there. That is the God who created and that is the God who sustains us. Just the notion that this all happens, self-existence is... It just, it just overwhelms me how deep our sin can take us into sophisticated imbecility. Let me go home today, would you, and cut yourself. Well, not deep. And not at your neck. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to stop bleeding. Why? 
29 different things have to happen chronologically within those few seconds that you don't bleed to death. And you want me to think, I mean, I, do you know where we can go with this? And this is the result of mutations. This is the hand of God. And the same hand reaches down to save us. Here's the takeaway, and I'll close with prayer. God the Father Almighty is the maker of the heavens and earth and all who dwell in it. And he of his own love is the redeemer of his creation. And it will have a new humanity. And it will be in a new heavens and a new earth. Who is that new humanity? All who are in Christ. And Christ is in them. If you talk to a law enforcement officer, if you talk to law enforcement officers, uh, by the way, please note my word up there, redeemer. What does redeemer mean? Does anyone know? To buy back. Have any of y'all, how? With a ransom. Who bought back sinful men and the creation to bring them into a new heavens and a new earth? God the Father. Who was the ransom? God the Son. He bought you back. You know, if, um, if I... If, I, uh, I, if you talk to law enforcement officers that work in the area of kidnappings and a parent gets their child kidnapped, the hardest thing is to keep the parent from just running out and giving whatever they, they want their child back, to, to take them through the process for the ultimate safety of the child is very difficult for them because as parents, you can just see a father, a father is is driving. I got to, I'm willing to give anything to buy them back and the ransom. But that illustration falls apart because we were not kidnapped by sin. We were traitors in our sin. Yet God has loved us. And he not only buys us back, he gives his son to go to the cross to redeem us. I'm reminded of the story of Churchill. Uh, it, it, the, the details are challenged, and I, I can't speak for everything. But when a child, he was swimming up in Scotland with his family and other families, and he began to drown. And the little boy that was swimming with him ran and got his daddy, who was the gardener. And this Scottish man, gardener, jumped in, saved Churchill and the others. Churchill's family said to him, what can we give you? He said, oh, nothing. And they said, what, what? And they even wrote him. And he finally said, look, my boy that came and got me, that boy, he needs, uh, he needs an education. I don't want him to have to do what I do. So Churchill's parents paid his way to Imperial College. He became a microbiologist. The gardener's name was Fleming. His son became Sir Alexander Fleming, who was ultimately responsible in his research for something called penicillin that later was used when Churchill was prime minister to rescue him from death. Churchill's comment, it is a rarity that a man has his life saved two times, that a man owes his life two times to the same person. God made you. And glorious good news, God saved you for a new heavens and a new earth. Please come to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments that we could be together in your word. I would just ask it. you would speak to give your people praise and confidence 
that the one who made them has saved them and is almighty. And for those here who are seeking, I pray you would draw them to yourself. Because the one who made them, even when we rebelled against him and was captive to our own sin, he gave his son to pay the ransom and on the cross declared it's finished so that we might come to him. And then gives the Holy Spirit so that in a moment like this, he is calling, come to the one who created you through his son and the one who will save you by his son. Praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.